Cockerton, the acting chair of the 2030 Space and Spatial Steering Committee. And I'm going to read the report as part of your introduction. Space and Spatial Industry Growth Roadmap. Uh, the executive summary has been released. Welcome to Australia in Space TV. Thank you very much, Chris. It's great to be here. And obviously, Peter Woodgate, this is uh, a legacy that he's left behind, sadly, uh, passed away in December, hence you're the, the chair. He did. He um, uh, oversaw the uh, over two-year process that has been undertaken to deliver the, the roadmap in its current form. Um, and yes, it was with much sadness that he passed away very suddenly just before Christmas last year. Well, maybe you can, this is obviously an industry-led report. It was leaked, uh, released, this is uh, Friday the 16th of March, so it was released this week. It's uh, hot off the press, so to speak, and you launched it in Adelaide uh, earlier this week, handing it to the Australian Space Agency. Maybe you can talk us through the report, the intentions here, and uh, then we can go into some of the, the, C, the key recommendations. Certainly. So I guess the basic objective in putting this uh, roadmap together was a recognition that an industry perspective is um, needed for some of the planning work being done in Australia to try and achieve the, the, the objective of, of tripling the size of the space industry in Australia and, and increasing its um, uh, desired output to between 10 and 12 billion dollars worth of, of, of GDP uh, uh, activity and uh, whilst the space agency uh, is charged with establishing um, a strategy for the industry from a government perspective we thought it was best that industry be consulted and an industry view on issues that need to be addressed be developed and so we brought together uh, a large group of people um, in a working group to canvas the issues um, and identify a range of objectives and, and initiatives that can be undertaken to, to achieve that level of growth. And there are, as we said, nine key objectives that have been identified in the roadmap, um, which we believe if they are fully implemented, the potential for Australia's space and geospatial industries can be achieved. Um, and there is very, very significant potential, uh, both for economic development and creation of jobs, uh, but also uh, of strategic significance to Australia from a critical infrastructure, self-reliance, sovereign capability perspective, which in recent years has become of increasing uh, significance. And so given that sort of coincidence of, of factors, uh, we believe the roadmap is uh, more valuable now than, than ever. Well, one thing that stands out for me is the growth model, various options. There's a big gap between sort of the optimal versus uh, sort of scenario two, um, and then you, even the government target uh, as well. Do you think there is risk here of really missing out on that optimal and, and that what we can achieve? There's a, it's one of those things, if we don't do certain things early, we're going to miss out in the longer term? Indeed. So there, there is um, industry information around the rate of growth that's being achieved across the space and geospatial industry in Australia. And it's significant, but it's of an order of magnitude that would not allow us to achieve the sort of economic targets that we've been talked about by 2030. If that's going to be achieved, much more needs to be done. And beyond that, there is a huge amount of investment going on in other countries elsewhere around the world. Mm. If Australia does not um, lift its game and increase its focus on uh, space and spatial, it really does run the risk of being left behind. And so, yes, we believe, again, um, if the nine recommendations are uh, are implemented, um, then this potential can be achieved and the target for growth um, delivered. Does any of them stand out for you? Are they the nine together, a, a collective, uh, uh, or some take potential precedence over others? Um, I guess number one is number one for a reason, which is support for Australia's 
uh, for uh, Australia taking a, a major role in, in space missions. Um, and uh, we can't emphasise that enough. That really, that, that needs to be the linchpin activity because from that, so much flows. Um, number four, which is the uh, workforce mm. issue, is another very, very significant issue affecting space and spatial, but also a whole load of other industries in Australia. Um, and very significant action is necessary to, to build our capability, our workforce, uh, with the right skill sets and um, uh, competencies going forward. And that's not going to be something that can be achieved quickly. Yes. So it needs to be a concerted effort to address those problems. And I imagine um, that's one of those ones you've got to do early now indeed. to get the return in five to ten years. You can't wait. Uh, Indeed, and we're getting ever closer to 2030. It's actually only <laughs> seven years away. And effectively, uh, yes, you're right. If you think about it in terms of, of four or five year degrees, there's only uh, one and a bit uh, sort of cycles through that process uh, in elapsed time. Um, now, that's really important for the industry. Um, and uh, significant progress needs to be made on that issue if many of the other initiatives are going to be achieved. And look, we, the idea here is to get uh, the audience to, to check it out. We'll obviously have links uh, in the show notes to this and it's well worth the read. It's quite encouraging to see the strategies coming out and some leadership here from industry. Uh, but slightly off topic because also this week, major announcements around AUKUS and, yeah. you know, budget, um, uh, objectives set over the next sort of 20, 30 years, but it's also requiring uplift uh, of exactly what we're talking about here in terms of employment, education, training and technical skills and capabilities. Do you think that kind of AUKUS type of announcements, is that encouraging for you or does that potentially dampen the impacts of space or how do you see them aligning? Yeah, well, um, I, I'm not sure it has that impact, but um, if I can comment on the AUKUS deal, clearly defence is a major consumer of space and geospatial technology and capability. And given the defence plans uh, for Australia, that is going to be a growing area of demand for these types of, of, of services, products, uh, data, uh, intelligence, analytics, etc. Et so effectively, you add AUKUS on top of that, and it's really just really emphasising how important this is. Um, from a submarine perspective, um, there are all sorts of supply chain issues for which um, space and spatial technologies will be used. There will be the actual um, navigation and guidance system for the for the boat itself or boats, um, as well as uh, a whole range of related technologies used for weapons uh, control uh, systems. So there there is a, a direct connection there. But I think the more fundamental one is as Australia's defence agenda continues to develop and progress, new technologies, emerging technologies, particularly coming from space and geospatial industries, are going to be ever increasingly demanded. And what we don't want to see, and in fact what defence doesn't want to do, is be reliant on overseas contractors for the majority of those capabilities. They would much rather see those capabilities delivered by sovereign country, uh, sorry, sovereign companies here in Australia so that uh, we have a greater self-reliance. I suppose one thing on that partnerships and, and the core partnership space is a very global sector. I just happened to be speaking on the Pacific recently in the impacts of AUKUS. Is there much outreach here and opportunity for Australia within the region as well rather than just our own sovereign capability? Um, we haven't focused on that to any great degree, but I think intrinsically the answer is yes. Australia has taken on a renewed interest in the Pacific and our near neighbours. And I think um, fundamentally there is no obstacle to uh, the space and spatial industries joining with 
uh, any move to broaden out and, 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 and reach out to our near neighbours to provide them with additional services and capabilities. Um, I, I know in a number of specific cases where that's happening in our industry anyway, outside of, of defence and, and the world of geopolitics, um, just in, in a practical sense, this, the, they are dealing with a whole range of issues similar to those here, here in Australia to do with climate change, sea level rise, severe weather events, um, uh, crop and, and forestry issues. So um, there's, there's a lot of commonality there. And obviously uh, a big customer base, I imagine, too. That's uh, really where our customer base could be as well. Well, if we go back to space and spatial as industries and industry development, one of the big opportunities for developing those industries in Australia are the export opportunities. Um, Australia has a very strong reputation um, in terms of scientific research and innovation. Um, there is only limited exporting of that capability in commercial terms. Part of the development of the space and spatial industries will come from Australian companies selling that expertise overseas. Um, that can be led on the back of um, regional support, uh, but it, it's quite capable of being transitioned into a full commercial proposition going forward, earning significant export dollars for the country. Now, the intention here is obviously industry advising uh, sort of the national uh, uh, roadmap sort of outline that the Australian Space Agency has. Uh, any early feedback? Uh, and then also we'll get you to touch on where the full report, the full uh, roadmap will, will be released. But, yeah, well received uh, early or any initial feedback? Certainly. Well, as I said, this um, roadmap has been two, two years in development and there's been extensive industry and stakeholder um, consultation undertaken throughout its uh, development. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have on our working party uh, most of the key stakeholders in the industry, uh, both from a government, academic and uh, commercial background, um, which has been fantastic. It has ensured that um, the roadmap reflects um, what those various stakeholders uh, deem to be important going forward. And so, in a sense, there are no surprises in the roadmap, or shouldn't be, from that from that that group. Um, we've delivered now the the roadmap to the uh, the space agency. They've seen early drafts of it, so again, they've known what's been right. coming for some time. And uh, Enrico Palermo, the uh, CEO, um, made some very uh, positive comments about the value of the roadmap and how much it's been appreciated by the Australian Space Agency um, in, in receiving it this week. Um, we've got a number of plans now to see the various um, initiatives implemented. Um, one of the things we've done in the roadmap is already identify um, a, a range of sub uh, initiatives or, or, or uh, projects to be undertaken, as well as what we call action champions, um, which are organisations best placed to take those uh, actions forward. Um, we will now be talking with each of those uh, organisations to reconfirm their willingness to pick up the mantle, so to speak, and move forward on those initiatives. And the full uh, sort of roadmap and, and the sort of the, the, the details, they'll be released uh, in May at the Andy Thomas Space Forum, the 15th Space Forum? Certainly. Uh, so that document is very comprehensive. It's got the full details of all of our um, uh, consultation processes and a lot more elaboration on the initiatives and the rationale uh, that's been developed for their, why they've come to be. Um, in that document, that will be released, as you say, in early May, um, both at the Space Forum and back-to-back uh, -back with that is the uh, Geospatial Industries National Forum called LOCATE, um, which is being held in Adelaide at the same time, uh, just later that week. Um, and then in between the two, there is a Space and Spatial Workshop, which will be focusing specifically on the overlap. And that's something we should, should recognise. Um, 
one of the key objectives of this whole exercise has been to promote the synergy that exists between the space industry and the geospatial industry. They come from things, a slightly different perspective, but it is working in uh, collaboration and, and on uh, uh, sharing of, of, of information and expertise that the true potential of both industries can be achieved. That, that's a, a key point that uh, the strategy, sorry, the roadmap makes and has been well received across both industries. Very good. Well, look, we're media partners to both of those events in May in Adelaide, so we'll definitely be there. Um, the way that the, the executive summary has been put together, it does read like a, a, a true strategy. There's clear action. Uh, so I think roadmap is a, an apt term as well, but you could definitely see it as a national strategy uh, with very clear deliverables. Uh, and so it's a very well presented. Like I said, to the uh, for the audience, definitely worth uh, having a look. And if you're in the space industry or even in uh, the geospatial uh, sort of sectors, uh, this is definitely one to have a look at. Uh, and a, <laughs> a, a kudos to the Australian Space Agency for receiving it as well. I mean, that's sometimes you hear about industry consultation. This is sort of it in uh, its truest sense as well, as far as I'm concerned. So Glenn Cogerton, the acting chair of the 2030 G, uh, Space and sorry Space and Spatial Steering Committee, well done on a great body of work, uh, and obviously there, um, uh, having lost your chair uh, along the way, uh, it does uh, sort of be a testament uh, to Peter as well. So well done to okay. everybody involved, uh, and well worth a read. So thank you very much for joining us on Australian Space TV. Thank you, Chris. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.